Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, welcome. I'm Carlos Chasura, President and CEO of the New York Building Congress. Let me say thank you for coming out on a Friday, a beautiful day. Uh, I know everybody wants to be outside. So when we figured we were hosting our first ever uh, Innovation Best Practices Technology Conference, we had to do it with a backdrop that made you feel like you were outside on a Friday in June. So give yourselves a round of applause for being here today. Um, before I begin the program, let me say thank you to the entire board of the New York Building Congress and the New York Building Foundation. And let me welcome the chairman of the board of the Building Congress, a dear friend, someone who is uh, an innovator in his own right with his company and everything he is doing. Uh, Milo Reverso serves as the president and CEO of STV, and I'm proud to call him the chair of the New York Building Congress. Give a round of applause to Milo Reverso. So they had a prepared speech for me, and uh, I told Elon, I think I'm gonna ad lib this, I hate reading these speeches, and uh, he got a little nervous. But uh, I'm gonna ad lib it. And, um, I want to welcome you all. I think this is a vision of the Building Congress that was formed six years ago um, when, when um, a, a group of board, of board members asked Tom Scaramangelo to become chairman of the Building Congress. And um, he hemmed and hawed, he had the duties of running his firm and, um, and he finally acclimated and, and agreed to, um, acquiesced and agreed to our, our request for him to step up and be chairman of the Building Congress on the proviso that he could lead a, a charge in, in innovation, in documenting innovation around the world um, and bringing it to New York and, um, and, and, uh, and exposing New York and making New York the lead of design and construction uh, in the world rather than taking second step. And um, he formed a committee, he formed subcommittees, and then he, he instituted this, um, you know, which led and culminated in our first conference, and it's the, the beginning. We have very unique issues, and we have some so, uh, not, not unique issues in New York. Our population's growing, our, our built environment is growing. The, um, Public infrastructure needs to keep up with that, whether it's schools, hospitals, uh, cultural, transportation. And, um, and we have to figure out more efficient ways, um, ways to disturb less of the built environment and the quality of life of our occupants in New York City. And this conference is, is meant to uh, bring innovation from around the world to New York and to uh, join us all as an industry in developing more unique ways and more innovative ways of accomplishing and getting the most out of um, our, our, our infrastructure systems, our built environment, to do it better, to do it easier, uh, to leave less of a footprint on this earth. And um, I just wanna thank Carlo and, and the Building Congress staff for organizing this event. Um, and it's the fruition of uh, a lot of forethought. So I hope you all uh, enjoy the conference. I hope you all take away from this conference, and I hope it results in building a better New York. Thank you. Thank you, Milo. Um, and let me really start by thanking uh, the Innovation Council. Um, as Milo mentioned, it began uh, with uh, Tom Scarangello many years ago, and uh, I think at one of my first lunches with Tom, he said to me, we've had this council, we've talked a lot, we really have to do something. And um, it took us a couple of years to get this conference really uh, where it needed to be, but we are so excited that something that many people, and I can't name everybody, but many people have had a part in are here uh, to make this happen. So to start, <coughs> excuse me, thank you to Tom Scarangello, Chairman and CEO of Thornton Tomasetti, former Chairman of the Building Congress. Tom, thank you for keeping us focused and making sure this happened. Uh, Carl Galliotto, President HOK, one of the co-chairs, and Charlie Murphy, Senior Vice President, 
Turner Construction, one of the co-chairs. Give these gentlemen a big round of applause. You will be hearing from them throughout the day. Um, I always say I have the easiest job of anybody running an organization because all I need to do is kind of show up, give a nice speech, and then turn it over to people that do the work. Uh, but please give a round of applause to the Building Congress team that did all the work for today, led by Alana Drought, Elon Stern, George Kwan, Janine Badalamenti, and the entire team. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> Our sponsors, as you know, putting events like this uh, cost a lot of money, but they're very exciting. Um, our groundbreakers, of course, the New York Building Foundation, which is the charitable arm of the New York Building Congress. And if you don't know much about it, you should go on the website and see what we are doing. We um, fund organizations throughout the city that are doing work in the built environment. Um, and it's really an exciting time to really help nonprofits grow. And as Milo said, the city is growing. And as a Brooklyn guy, to me, the city is growing not just where we are sitting in midtown Manhattan, but the growth of the city is Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, the Bronx. Um, there was a report out yesterday or the day before that talked about Brooklyn leading the way in job growth over Manhattan. And I think that story is going to be told more and more. And the Building Foundation can play a unique role in helping organizations throughout the city grow and prosper. So check us out. Um, Trend centers, AT&T, Building Connected, HOK, STV Group, Suffolk, Thornton Tomasetti, Turner Construction Company, and WSP. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> our, our pioneer sponsors, A. Esteban and Company, all the signage that you see is thanks to Esteban. So I don't know if he's here yet, but if you are, thank you. Uh, we appreciate all you do for us. Uh, BJH Advisors, Delta Airlines, the IDC Foundation, JBMB, Langan, and National Grid, thank you for all you do. Our media par partner, The Real Deal, and a special thanks to Totem uh, for being a great partner in helping us put this conference together. Tucker, I know you're here somewhere. Thank you for all that you do. So what is the Building Congress? Why are we here? Uh, we, just, we just undertook a great strategic planning process. And as we look toward our 100th anniversary, which is coming up uh, in two years, um, it was critical that the Building Congress remain a forward-thinking, innovative organization that understands something very simple. Our members are building some of the most unique, greatest projects in the world from airports to subways to bridges to tunnels, universities, hospitals, parks, senior housing, uh, everything in between. So they are already innovative. But sometimes this industry doesn't get the credit for being as innovative as you all are. And our job is very simple, uh, to continue to lay out a vision for the organization that reflects all of our members. And we've laid out a vision which is very simple, three primary objectives, one of which is to foster innovation. And that means promoting innovative methods, workforce practices, legislation, and uh, Albany and the City Council and Washington are critical in looking at how we are innovating project delivery across the country. And of course, looking at projects in the five boroughs and the region. And I think uh, for us, the centerpiece is this Ascend Conference. This is the beginning. Uh, we're gonna learn a lot from today. We are gonna um, put out an amazing report in a few months talking about what we've learned from this conference. Um, and we're not shy. And if anyone knows me, you know I tell it the way it is. So if we learn something great, we're going to talk about it. But if we learn something that offers a challenge but an opportunity, we're going to talk about it even more. Because this industry is all about taking challenges 
creating opportunities, and building the great things you see around us. And it is time for everybody to understand that, for the powers that be, whether in elected office or other, to understand what all of you are doing. And it's an opportunity to showcase the innovation, the technology, the best practices, the ideals that New York is creating. Um, I don't like to hear when people say, oh, in China they're doing this, in Dubai they're doing this, in Germany they're doing this. I want to hear, oh, in China they copied something that we did in New York. In Dubai they echoed something that companies in New York are doing. In Germany they're focused on innovative methods that people in this room created. That's the goal of, of our industry. It's the goal of innovation. And I think it's one of the goals that should come out of this conference. So I really thank you all for being here. Uh, please note AIA credits are available for this conference. Um, so you can sign up for them at the front desk. Follow along with us today on social media, hashtag 19 Ascend. Uh, we hope you stay for the day. You'll have opportunities to mingle, to network, to learn. Um, I was very excited when I did not know 90% of the people on the panels today. That means I think we did a great job. Um, and I think the team, uh, my staff, and Totem did an incredible job in putting together a real innovative day for all of you. So let's get things cracking. Let me welcome to the stage one of our Council of Innovation co-chairs, Charlie Murphy, Senior Vice President of Turner Construction, who will introduce our first keynote speaker. I'm not gonna say anything about our keynote, because Charlie is, other than I've gotten to know him relatively well in the last few weeks. Um, we serve on the uh, panel that is looking at redeveloping the BQE, and I can tell you if anyone knows about innovation and new ideas, it's our guest speaker. So I'm looking forward to hearing it. Charlie, the floor is yours. Thank you, everybody. Good morning, everybody. And, uh, before I start, I just want to give a shout out to Turner Interiors. We uh, built this space for the New York Times many years ago. Still looks great. I just, it's, and it's my pleasure to, to uh, uh, introduce our first speaker this morning, Rohit Agrawal. Rohit is the, or RIT, is the head of the Urban Systems and Sidewalks Lab. In addition to his position at Sidewalks Lab, RIT is an adjunct professor of international and public affairs at Columbia University and recently chaired the Regional Plan Association's five-year effort to develop a fourth regional plan for the New York metropolitan area. Previously, he spent five years at Bloomberg Philanthropies, where he headed the sustainability practice for Bloomberg Associates, was special advisor to the chairman of the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group during Mayor Bloomberg's chairmanship of the organization, and he inaugurated the Bloomberg Philanthropies Environment Program, which grew to a total of $145 million in grants under his management. Very impressive. At Sideworks Lab, Ritz team is building an experimental new district in Canada's largest city, home of the uh, NBA championship now, <laughs> as of last night, where the, la yes, you may applaud, where the latest technologies will be used to address urban issues like affordable housing, traffic congestion and safety, and environmental problems. Sidewalk Toronto, a joint effort by the Waterfront Toronto and Sidewalks Lab, will create a new kind of mixed-use, com uh, complete community on Toronto's eastern waterfront, beginning with the creation of the Quayside. By combining people-centered urban design with cutting-edge technology, Sidewalks Lab strives to achieve new standards of sustainability, affordability, and economic opportunity. Please join me in welcoming Rick as our opening speaker. All right, thank you, Charlie, um, and uh, thank you, Milo and Carlo, for um, 
for leading this great organization. Uh, and, I, and I can't say how excited I am to be here and have the honor and privilege of, of kicking off this, this morning's conversation as a lifelong native New Yorker um, and somebody who's been concerned about the future of the city for my entire career. I cannot say how strongly I agree with the idea that innovation in how we build our city may in fact make the difference between a really great future for New York, which we all know can be, or one where we simply muddle through and watch other cities around the world eat our lunch. Uh, and so congrats to the Building Congress for taking this on and making it so important a focus in their strategic plan. I thought I'd start off today by talking a little bit about the way we think about technology and innovation at Sidewalk Labs. Um, and I have this irony where I work for Alphabet, for one of the world's largest technology companies, and we're supposed to be forward-looking. But in fact, my academic training is looking backwards. I have a PhD in history, uh, and I focused on the history of cities. And so I can't help but think about the future in terms of the past. And it's one of the things we do here at Sidewalk Labs. Because what we think about is how the future can be informed by what we know has happened over time. And to a certain extent, the history of modern cities, the way we know them, really starts about 200 years ago with what is the first modern technological change that fundamentally reshaped cities. And that was the steam engine. Because it was the steam engine that allowed the growth of large-scale factory production that made it desirable to have millions of people in the same place. It was the steam engine that gave us the railroad and the steamship that allowed our cities to be connected to the countryside and to cities around the world. And it was the steam engine that started creating the lifestyle that we all take for granted. About 50 years later, there was the next one. The second revolution in urban technology was electricity, which first of all, of course, gave us the 24-hour day and made it possible to use our streets in a different way, to use our shops in a different way. But it also reshaped the city, because without electricity, you couldn't have skyscrapers, you couldn't have elevators, you couldn't have safe interior lighting at that scale. You couldn't actually have subways and streetcars. And so the electric grid reshaped the city. And then a generation or so later was the automobile, which of course had both beneficial, but also many negative impacts, as we well know, on the city. But there is no denying the power of that technological revolution to reshape our cities. And it wasn't just about the streets. It was about the form of the cities. It was about the social organization of how we used our urban spaces. All of these things built on the backs of this one technological change. And if you think about it, that really is the last one. The last big technological revolution that has reshaped cities was the advent of the automobile. And if you look here at Market Street in San Francisco in the 1940s and today, it's different. It's not that different. In terms of the technologies we use, in terms of how we use space, in terms of that, how that environment is constructed, it's not all that different. But if you look two generations before that, prior to two previous revolutions in technology, you see just how different it is. Because the 1870s, whether it's in San Francisco or New York or London or Tokyo, was radically, radically different than it was in the middle of the 20th century. And we see that even in our interiors. If you walked into a living room in the United States circa the late 1940s, it would feel a little antiquated, but you'd know what to do. You'd know how to turn on the TV. You'd use the toaster. You'd understand how the kitchen worked. It would be basically the same experience that we have today. Uh, sorry, I missed one, but I oh don't know. Um, but if you walked into a house from the 1870s, you wouldn't quite know what to do. The bathroom wouldn't work the same. The kitchen wouldn't work the same. You'd have to light a fire to make your toast. It wouldn't really make sense to you. And so what we're facing, the way we think about it at Sidewalk Labs, is that we are on the cusp of the fourth revolution in urban technology. And unlike these other three, it's not just one thing that is changing. It's a confluence. It's a connectivity, which we all know now over the last 10 years, we've gone from occasionally having a mobile phone to having universal connectivity for something like half the world's population. We've gone to computing power that can do more in a nanosecond than we could do in a week 20 years ago. 
We've got machine intelligence, which increasingly we can rely on machines to make certain kinds of decisions. They have to be done under supervision, but certain kinds of decisions better than we can. We've gotten sensors that can keep track of what's going on in our environment. Not only can they do that, but even more important, they can do so at such a low cost and at such a small scale that they can become universal and we can understand what's going on around us in an entirely different way. And of course, there's a whole set of things that, as you will explore over the rest of this day, arrive at what is really a complete redesign of how design and technology and how design and construction can take place. And so it was with this thinking four years ago that Google uh, decided to create a moonshot to tackle this opportunity of urban technology. And it became Sidewalk Labs just at about the same time that Google, of course, became Alphabet. So now we are a sister company to Google, just like we're a sister company to Waymo and several of the other, other bets, as they are called. Um, and our mission is to combine world-class urban design with cutting-edge technology to achieve the kinds of goals that Charlie talked about uh, when he introduced me. And I think this is an important thing because it's not just about the blind application and adoption of technology. It is about the intentional adoption of technology informed by great design, by a deep understanding of what makes cities good, and an understanding of how you have to change cities. And that is what we think will make us different. When we started out four years ago, we knew we weren't the first people to think about cities, to think about how you do different things in cities. And so we started with a certain measure of humility by understanding the state of innovation across the world, by understanding all of the previous attempts to apply great design and great technology to an urban environment. We convened working groups and we concluded in the end, after about a year's worth of work, that in fact what made sense was to try this out at a district scale, because it's only at the neighborhood scale that we thought it would be possible to layer on all of the different innovations, most of which will change one aspect of the urban experience, one aspect of urban economics. But if you put them all together and you have the freedom to do so in one place, we think the results can be, in fact, revolutionary. And we looked around the world for a great location, and happily we arrived at a place knowing full well that it would be a great place for a basketball team as well. Because <laughs> we have that kind of foresight, you know. Um, and we identified the great city of Toronto, Ontario, um, which is remarkable for many reasons. As a, as a great urban center, it is one of the fastest growing cities in, in North America. It's one of the largest cities in North America. It is due to grow so much faster than New York and the Bay Area uh, here in the United States over the next uh, decade and 20 years. It has a really interesting set of working partnerships and a, and a unique institution in something called Waterfront Toronto, which is akin in some ways to our EDC or ESDC, but in fact is a joint venture, literally owned one-third by the federal government, one-third by the provincial government, and one-third by the city, um, which realizes the fact that there is nothing one does at an ambitious level in a city that does not involve multiple layers of government. And of course, Toronto faces the same problem as successful cities across North America and around the world. They have a, a massive problem of unaffordable housing. Um, it's even strikingly unaffordable from a New Yorker's perspective. They have stressful commuting patterns. Their, their transit and, in fact, their highway system is woefully inadequate to the kind of vibrant, populous city that they've become. And like so many cities, they are increasingly facing the challenge of lower and lower opportunity for more and more of their people. Um, <clears throat> our approach, and we've been working on this for about a year and a half, and in fact, I'm happy to say that in a matter of weeks, we will be putting forward our detailed proposal to the people and governments of Toronto. Our approach for the last year and a half has been to focus deeply on how we might apply innovation to these five areas that are critical to shaping our urban environment. Um, and I'll go through them. Uh, but with objectives that we set for ourselves in partnership with Waterfront Toronto, our government partner. On buildings, perhaps but not exclusively the most uh, interesting component to you all here at the Building Congress, um, there are five components to the way we're thinking about the buildings in this district. One is to adopt an approach of radical mixed use. 
not just assembling buildings that are nearby, not just a neighborhood scale, but actually thinking about how can we get as many uses into the same building envelope? What does that require us to do in terms of monitoring safety? What does that require us to do in terms of designing flexibly? And that leads us to the next thing. Because one of the things we saw as we look throughout history, of course, is that needs change. The office of today is different from the office of 15 years ago, is different from the office of 15 years from now. The housing, pro the housing typologies are different. The neighborhoods that we want to do different things in are different. And so the worst thing you can do is actually design a building that should last for 100 years with a use that is inflexible and is only suited to what's likely to be for the next 10. Um, and so we're thinking about how do you think about buildings that are explicitly designed to be changeable over time? What do you have to build in? What do you have to design out that creates inflexibility? We're thinking about the regulatory frameworks. Um, we all know, of course, we have design-based or outcome-based codes that really aren't about the outcomes. They're really primarily about the modeled outcomes. And we don't take uh, actual uh, performance into account. And so what we're thinking about is how do you apply those sensor technologies that allow us to keep track of what's going on cheaply and in real time and actually unlock some of the constraints at the outset because you know you'll be able to keep track of what's going on as the buildings perform as they are being used. We're thinking about new technologies and materials, which I'll talk about, to focus on one of our big ideas that we are really excited about is that we are going to propose that this entire district it starts out at about 15 acres on, on what Charlie described as, as this Quayside neighborhood. We think it should set the standard for a much larger area of its downtown waterfront that still has to be redeveloped. But our proposal is going to include building all of the buildings out of timber and doing so not at a five or 10 story level, but at a 20 or 30 story height to achieve the kind of densities that make sense in that environment as they do here. Uh, and we think this is possible. We think in fact that with compressed laminated timber and we've been working closely with that, that industry both here in, in North America and in Europe, not only do you achieve all of the fire and strength uh, ratings that you need? And I'm sure you all know that CLT is both stronger than steel and has a better fire rating than steel. But it also allows you to do construction in a way, as Milo pointed out, that has far less impact on the surrounding neighborhood and can go up much, much quicker. And I don't have to tell you all and if you can have less impact, you can build more quickly and your components are easier to assemble because you do so much of the work in a factory using a robotic technology that you radically reduce the cost, you radically reduce the build time, you radically reduce the likelihood of neighborhood opposition. And it has the happy byproduct, particularly in a place like Canada, of creating what we think will be an entire new industry of the people who will be making the compressed laminated timber components and the modular construction components. We're also thinking about mobility because you can't actually build a city, you can't build a neighborhood within a city, you can scarcely build a building in a condensed uh, city without thinking deeply about mobility. And here we remind ourselves that innovation and technology are not just about applying digital tools to every problem. We have a, a great transit network that's below its scale and one of the critical challenges in Toronto is actually financing, and so we will be proposing a financing approach to extend an existing light rail system to our district, but we are also thinking about the farther away future and doing so in a flexible way because we don't know when autonomous vehicles will be ready for widespread urban use. We know they're coming, we want them to come, and so what we're thinking about is how do you design, for example, a set of streets that are appropriate today, excuse me, but could easily shift their use over time as autonomous vehicles uh, become more widely adopted. How do we redesign streets, for example, that can manage the increased demands for pickups and drop-offs, for deliveries that we know today dominate urban mobility needs, and don't focus on the older uses of long-term parking, of unloading 18-wheelers for retailers that we know are not the same as they were 10 and 15 years ago. <clears throat> and. Uh, in the public realm, which is of course the critical, unique component of the urban experience. What happens in a living room, what happens in a conference room, it could take place in a, in a wheat field somewhere or it could take place on Times Square. That specific experience is the same. What's irreplaceable 
is what goes on in the public realm. And so one of our objectives must be to design a public realm that is better, more attractive, and more frequently used. And so part of it starts from the benefits you get from better technology in the mobility system. Autonomous vehicles will be better for pedestrians if we manage them right. We don't have to devote that kind of space that clutters up our public realm for vehicle storage. That makes it more attractive to be outside. We need to integrate our streets and ground floor retail because in fact we know that the public realm isn't from sidewalk to sidewalk, it's actually from building core to building core on the ground floor. And so what we are thinking about is a new approach to ground floor retail that is more like the flexible outdoor space of the public realm, we call it STOA. And the idea is how can you reimagine that ground floor in a way that might feel like a place that's designed to encourage pop-ups, that's, in, that's designed to encourage the kind of agile retail concepts that we think we see already as being attractive and we think are only gonna get more attractive. We're thinking about weather mitigation strategies, um, including things like building raincoats with new materials uh, that recreate the arcades that we think are so wonderful about many cities, particularly in Europe, as a means to mitigate weather extremes, but also don't block sunlight, but don't block the other things that we like about having open air. Um, and one of the benefits, particularly, of ceasing to focus on outdoor space as a place to store vehicles is that you literally can double the amount of open space in a given neighborhood without sacrificing economics or density. Um, we have ambitious goals for sustainability. Some of you I, I see in the audience I worked with when I uh, started the sustainability office here in New York City, and so this is something that's near and dear to my heart and to our entire team. Uh, and our objective is, in fact, to achieve climate positivity, to have a neighborhood that is exporting more renewable energy than the limited remainder of fossil fuels that it is consuming. Um, it starts with passive house standard buildings. They won't, in fact, be passive house because, as probably all of you know, passive house uh, doesn't really conform to most commercial uses, especially at that height. Um, but they will achieve the same kind of performance. We're thinking we are investing in uh, technologies that will do advanced levels of building energy management. We are thinking about a wide variety of things, and you can read faster than I can speak. But what it adds up to is a systematic approach to getting this neighborhood off of fossil fuels. We will not be laying natural gas pipes into this district. Um, it will be all electric but its consumption will be so low that that will be affordable and we will be giving uh, the people and the businesses who uh, live and work in this neighborhood the tools to manage their electricity consumption in a way that allows them to pay the kinds of bills they want but push off the kinds of tedious decisions about how to make yourself more efficient onto machine learning. One of the big concerns about technology in the urban environment, and it's a highly legitimate one, is about how you use the data that we know is already being collected. And it's one of the things that I think we have to recognize as people who live in advanced cities. This is not a question about what we do in the future. This is a question about what we are already doing. Because our cities are already monitored, when we, whether it's the closed circuit TV cameras that are almost ubiquitous on so many of our big city streets, whether it's how we monitor traffic, whether it's things that are being done for security, uh, whether it's the simple issues as how much information, as we all know, is stored every time you swipe your Metro card. Uh, data is already present, and so this is not a new thing. This is an existing challenge, and one of the things that we have been working to innovate on is really more institutional than technological, um, and that is how do, you manage tech, how do you manage the data that is being collected in an urban environment where, by definition, people can't realistically opt out. In theory, at least, you can decide not to use Google for your searches. You can decide not to use Facebook for your uh, social media if you don't like their terms of service. But if I simply put up a sign and say, hey, the DOT or the MTA or the PD has a camera in Times Square, it's not realistic for you to say, well, I'm gonna opt out of using Times Square. And so we have to think about urban data collection differently, and that is something that Sidewalk Labs is proposing to the people of Toronto. First, the creation of a civic data trust. Because one of the issues, of course, one of the big concerns about collecting data is not that it's collected for the purpose it's intended, which in many cases, whether it's to protect us from bad guys or to monitor traffic or what have you, we all agree that's a good use of data. But it's what else might be done with that information. 
And that's a serious concern. We think a third party, a non-governmental entity, set up like a foundation or a trust or something, that would keep that data, give it to the entities that collect it for their stated purposes, but also start to withhold it if they are not acting in a responsible way, make it available, for example, to researchers or governments, uh, because that is usually a legitimate use on application when entities like that have to say, well, here's how we're going to use it, here's how we're going to protect it. Um, and then finally, yes, make it open to other commercial uses, but for a fee, and make sure that the entity that collected it originally is not, in fact, incentivized to look harder and harder to find ways to monetize that data. Sidewalk Labs has said from the beginning, this is not about monetizing data. We don't think that urban data is this gold mine that can justify all sorts of other things. The data is a means to an end. It is a means to the end of a better managed urban environment. Um, we think part of this is about responsible data use guidelines that we will be the first to sign up for, but we think ought to be applied to all entities uh, collecting and using data. And that will have to be enforced by this entity, by this civic data trust, through a responsible data use assessment that is the kind of housekeeping that has to take place in the same way that building inspections, that, that uh, fire inspections, that other inspections take place of our physical infrastructure. The responsible data use is that same kind of inspection to make sure that people are doing what they should be doing with data. And then, of course, open standards, because one of the critical challenges is this risk of lock-in. And we are making the commitment that none of what we are doing is trying to lock this neighborhood or the city of Toronto into our system. So everything will be accessible through open APIs. Everything will be transferable over time. Um, and, I, and I'm really excited, I think, about this because although there's a lot of controversy about the data aspects of this project, what we see is it has opened up a conversation that has led, for example, the city council in Toronto to direct the staff of the city government to create a new set of urban data use uh, standards and regulations, and we welcome that. And in fact, the Toronto Board of Trade uh, has in fact suggested building on our idea that the Toronto Public Library be, be empowered to play the role of the Civic Data Trust. And that's a decision for the people of Toronto to make, but we think it's an interesting concept and one that should be explored. Sidewalk Lab's role in all of this is actually to fill the gap without which we think none of this would take place. Because the task of innovating at a district scale requires changes in infrastructure, it requires changes in design and technology, it requires changes in the way economic development is done, um, and it requires changes in how real estate developers work. And if you leave this just to the private sector, or if you leave this, leave this realistically to a fragmented, still fragmented government sector, you're not going to be able to do all of these things at once. And so the role that Sidewalk Labs envisions itself in this project is not that of a real estate developer. That's not our aspiration. It's not that of a government. But it is what we describe as being a catalyst to make sure that there is innovation being taken on at all steps of this process, to argue for the kinds of regulatory and institutional innovations that are critical to make it happen. Um, and to take the financial risk uh, for some of the innovations that, in fact, we know are not fully proven, even though we have high confidence in. Somebody's got to take the financial risk, and that's the kind of thing that a company that's excited about innovation, that has the resources and the risk appetite, as Alphabet and Sidewalk Labs do, that's the role that we see ourselves in. And the overall impact, we think, is tremendous. We think there is a huge opportunity to create a fantastic new urban environment that we think on the shores of Lake Ontario will set the stage uh, for tra changes in practice that could take place around the world. Um, we think it will be such a different experience at that ground floor level in the public realm with the new mobility system, when people see how streets really can work in a different way, when people see how new materials can make buildings go up more quickly and still keep rents down, uh, that there will be the desire to replicate these standards elsewhere, both across the city of Toronto and in other cities. We think there's a set of impacts that are quantifiable and some that in fact are not and will just have to be felt. There's the jobs impact that are, that's true for so many large developments. We think the economics of modular construction and timber construction and the speed allows us to do things in terms of affordability that without subsidy nobody else would be able to do. 
Um, we will achieve this climate positive objective. We will have a neighborhood that is ready for autonomous vehicles and will not have the kind of infrastructure challenges with adopting them that so many other places are going to have. And it will be a place that will invite innovation because with the kind of privacy policy that we will hope to have in place, it won't just be innovations from us as sidewalk labs. We want to make this a place where innovators from companies small and large, from research teams at big universities and nonprofits want to come to try out new things because both from an institutional and a regulatory uh, perspective, it will be easy to try new things because people will feel protected by the rules and standards that are there. And I think that's where I'd like to close and talk about briefly what I think the implications are for New York. Because the reality is, kind of like Carlo was saying about not wanting to see the news from China or the best practices from Europe, as a New Yorker, it kind of breaks my heart that we're doing this somewhere else. Um, and you know, if I think about what I would really love to achieve, it's how do we demonstrate that this is really practical in a place that is very much like this city so that it can be adopted. But the thing that I think I've learned most over the last four years working for Sidewalk Labs, the last year and a half working on this particular project, is a message that I hope you all think about over the course of the day, I hope informs the work of the Building Congress on this issue of innovation. It's not the technology. The technology is not the problem. Whether it's modular or drones or sensors or new ways of thinking about heating and cooling, none of that is hard to do. What's difficult is habit. What's difficult is fear. What's difficult is risk perception. What's difficult is changing institutions and incentives. And so at the end of the day, innovation in an urban environment is not, in fact, a technological challenge. Because I've seen what our, our technology teams can do. I've seen what our hardware and software engineers can do. I know what can happen within the various resources of Alphabet and its other peer companies in and outside of Silicon Valley. You all know that this stuff is real in part because they are doing things like this in Europe, in Asia. Our real task as New Yorkers is what it has always been, which is can we embrace change? Can we recognize that the costs of change, which are not fake, they are our real challenges, but that they are, they are acceptable to bear because change always has some cost, but the benefits outweigh those costs. And if the Building Congress in its work going forward and if the, uh, this conference can stimulate that kind of appetite for change, then I think you will have made a massive contribution to the city of New York. I was thinking as Carlo was talking uh, about the centenary coming up in 1920, or from in 2022, which means that the Building Congress was founded in 1922. I'm thinking similarly about the fact that I sit on the board of the RPA, whose centenary is coming up in 2021. Um, and how important the 40 years that straddled the turn of the previous century plus one uh, was. So from 1880 to 1920, we basically built New York. We built the sewers, we tied the five boroughs together, we built the subway system more or less the way it is today. We installed the electricity network, we started the very first highways. And it was in those 40 years of rapid adoption of new innovations that were technological in nature, but what they forced was the creation of new entities, of new organizations like the Building Congress, of new organizations like the RPA, of fundamentally new governmental institutions like the Port Authority, like in fact, the city of Greater New York. You think about that kind of revolution. That shaped this city and endowed us with the city that we've all enjoyed for all of our lives since none of us was here playing a role in that era. And I think it is the opportunity of this next fourth urban revolution, and it is the potential for New York to embrace and fully realize it. But it is also the risk that we won't, and the difference will be whether we can change our institutions, whether we can change our practices, whether we can have open enough minds to embrace these new ways of doing things and make use of the fourth urban revolution. Thank you.